I'm feeling good. You know why I'm feeling good? United won their first game of the season on Friday. We were the curtain raiser for the Premier League. I was thinking we would disappoint as per usual. I was thinking we would be the laughing stock we would be the laughing stock of the Premier League sides this weekend. But fortunately, fortunately for us, it didn't happen. And I'm so thankful because that was a tricky game. A tricky game against Fulham at home as the opening day fixture is not is not easy, especially with the club in turmoil as it is. We're going through a transition, an evolution, restructuring with the sport inside and Enios, partial ownership, blah de blah blah blah. Some of our targets were acquiring, some of them were not getting over the line. We're not too sure on who we're gonna sell. All these things are happening at the same time. And I honestly, honestly am so happy we won. There'll be further analysis of the game in depth on the next episode of the Axion Zinger Show. The next episode, not this episode, the next episode, I'll go into a bit more fully um, once I rewatch the match in full, because I like to do that sometimes after the fact to rewatch. I watch the match live, then I rewatch it in full just to make sure that my early impressions were not amiss. But the one thing I would want to point out about the previous game against Fulham on Friday, which we won, thankfully, 1 0. I have to give massive shout out to Casemiro. Casemiro was incredible. Now, don't get me wrong. More than likely, he won't be able to keep up that level of performance throughout the entirety of the league season. He's older in years. The Premier League is a very demanding league. We're going to have moments where we're going to play terrible. That's in our nature. It's almost in our DNA post Sirs Ferguson. But for the time being, considering how badly Casemiro ended last season... It's amazing to see him playing at this level right now. So flipping good. And if anything, I actually noticed him playing against Fulham, he actually looked a bit, he actually looked a lot more trim in the, in the body. Now, don't get me wrong. Casemiro's not a big guy. He's not a fat player. He's quite a slim guy anyway. But he looked way more slimmer than I remember him to be. He looked way fitter. He looked stronger. And the most important thing, he looked quicker off the mark. Because one of the things that was really concerning me and a lot of United fans last season is that Casemiro looked like one step off. He looked like a, a couple of steps off, off pace, which is usually a sign when a player's kind of over it and everyone's sort of thinking, oh shit, he better start learning Chinese. He better start learning Arabic. But no, he's not over the hill just yet. Because I never understood why we were trying to get rid of him anyway so quickly. We didn't really get that much out of him. Yes, I know we signed him and he's old. He's, on, he's a bit on the older side. We're not going to get the most years out of him. But I thought we could easily squeeze maybe a couple of seasons, if not three seasons out of him, playing at that high level. And so far, it's showing that to be the case. We still need cover for him, though. I, I see we're linked, we're linked with Ugarte, so I'm happy about that. We still need cover for this guy, but I was really happy to see him put in that performance. I was also happy to see Harry Maguire play really flipping well. Harry Maguire played amazingly well. Harry Maguire played amazingly well. And I've not been the biggest fan of Harry Maguire. I've not been the biggest fan of Harry Maguire. I think to begin with, we overpaid for him. I also think he was um, probably not the defender that we kind of needed to kind of spearhead and lead our defense. Um, the ego, the sort of like attitude that he had, the, the comments he makes in the press conferences, hated it. But to be fair to the guy, he has responded very well for a player that's been stripped of the captaincy that was dropped and it was made very clear to him, I think, for the manager and the club that they want to get rid of him. He's been very professional, kept his head down and like, unlike other players in that squad, he has just stuck to the football. And unlike Shaw, he didn't go to England with the Euros. He stayed with the team. Though it's probably likely because I'm not too sure the nature of his injury and how, how injured he was, but I could see a scenario if Harry Maguire wanted to, because Gareth Southgate loves him the same way he loves Luke Shaw, the same way he loves other England players we trust, I'm sure there's a scenario where if Harry Maguire wanted to play for England in the Euros, he probably could have went. He probably could have been a good squad option, a player coming off the bench if England wanted to close out the game because Gareth Southgate trusted him. But instead of doing that, he stayed home, he trained, he got a good preseason under, under his belt, and now he's paying dividends. So I'm glad to see him playing well because I think the options are really important. Because if we if we believe all the things that people say about the lit, which I don't believe, people say he's injury prone. I don't think that's the case. But you know, we already got Lenny Euro out. I think we're gonna need quality options just in case one or two get injured. You know, Alessandro Martinez sometimes gets injured throughout the season. It's just good to have a good options. And to be honest as well, our centre back pairings, our centre back 
or our defense in general or across the board is pretty decent i'd say the only place we're probably weak on is left back out and out left back whoever the starting left back is if they get injured we're kind of smashed because the other options are not as good as the first option. So I'm really happy to see Maguire playing well. Obviously, Maswari was an incredibly um, refreshing breath of... Recovery, was, it, was your breath of fresh air? No, it wasn't. It was good to be reminded what a quality play looks like. That's all I wanted to say. Maswari just came in. Because I don't think... It's been a while since we signed like a proper player that's like a first team quality. I don't mean squad quality, bench quality. I mean a player that could immediately start. And he did start immediately. And we saw the difference. Like, just a very good football player. The only thing I didn't like about Maswari, he didn't really offer much going forward. But I think in time that will happen. But in terms of just looking after the ball, in terms of occupying that space and just generally being very composed, under pressure, able to pass the ball, brilliant. And then, of course, Zerky. Zerky, Zerky, Zerky. I was talking so much crap during the live stream. And some people pointed it out to me. I was talking so much doo-doo on the live stream when I was suggesting, when I was suggesting, when I was suggesting incorrectly, of course, that Zerky hadn't touched the ball. I was so concerned. He hasn't touched the ball. What's going on? Who is this player? Blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, like all great strikers, all he needed, all he needed was one opportunity and he proved he proved his worth. And the thing that I love the most about Zerky's goal, Zerky's goal is this. Not the goal itself, the build-up play. That was classic striker build-up play. Receives the ball in the middle. Receives the ball in the middle. Chest it down. Passes it out into the wing. Runs inside the box. And is able to time his run for the cross to come in. Waits kind of like around the penalty spot. And then I actually thought it was Scott McTominay that kicked it in. I originally thought it came off his knee. But you watch the replay slowly. You actually see, he actually side-footed it into the goal. Half volley side-footed it into the bottom corner. A very cultured and astute finish. Very much so. And the other thing about Zerski, he's fucking huge. He's like 6'4". There was a shot. There was like a panning shot, like near the pitch as he was coming on. Honestly, I swear to God, Zerski's actually taller. On my go on my life, Zerski's actually taller, I think, than Delit. He might actually be like Maguire's height. He's crazy big. So when he came on the pitch, you see like this there was a camera angle that was almost like eye length, like kind of. And you could see how tall he was, and because he was running past the players, and he looked like a mountain. I was like, rah, Ted. He is massive, and he'd probably look taller if he pulled up his socks. He kind of does that, like, low sock style, where he tucks his socks behind his shin pads. If he pulled his socks up all the way, I think he'd look actually taller. <laughs> his legs would look way longer. That guy is massive, mate. But he looks rapid. He looks very quick-footed and stuff, so I'm very excited to see what's going to be happening with him in the future. And it's just nice to have an option. When Hoyland's out, we can play him. We can play them together. You can take him off the, you know, whatever. You can rotate. That's really important because I think we put too much pressure and we put too much reputation on Hoyland last season even though he stepped up and was there for us for the most part especially with Martial being ostracized and injured I think it's nice to have that option and give him a rest and, and I think the competition for places too will help Hoyland play at his pump so I'm really 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 excited about the future going forward but we still need in my opinion if I if I was living in a fantasy world if I was living in a fantasy world I would say we still need two signings in my personal opinion if I was living in a fantasy world, I would say we need another left back signing. Personally, for me, that's what I would do because I don't think Harry Amas is ready. I think Malasia has been out for a while, so to expect him to come back is a bit up in the air. Luke Shaw is consistently injured and is supposed to be going to be back in October, but I don't trust him. So if it was me, if it was me, I'd go for another left back. And I'd go for a DM to obviously the Ugate position, like an Ugate, someone like Ugate, someone that can cover the blade, of, someone that can cover every blade of grass, somebody that's technically proficient, somebody that can intercept balls, somebody that's like good in the tackle, aggressive, like that kind of style of defensive midfielder to allow the other midfielders to play a bit forward. Because I, I would personally, I don't want Mano playing so deep. As much as I like him playing there, I think he's actually more impactful and and impacts the game. And there's a more of a danger when he plays further up in the number eight, let's say, position. So I want I want in that position of a, of a DM, I want it to be a conventional number six or a number four. I don't want an eight or a ten or whatever to play there. I want it to be a four or a six. So I, if it was me, I'd go for another left back just to be sure, just to be safe. And then, of course, I'd go for a, a, a DM. In an ideal world, 
in an ideal world, if we was talking ideally, I'd go for three. I'd go for a left back. I'd go for a DM to cover Casemiro. And I'd go for a, an, an attacking midfielder to challenge Bruno Fernandes. Because I feel like that's the only position in our squad where there's not adequate competition for places. Because I feel like the reason why we're getting the best out of Maguire now, the reason why we're seeing even maybe Casemiro play out of his skin the first game of the season, I think they realise there's actual competition for places now. Like your spot isn't guaranteed anymore, so they're pushing themselves, trying harder. There's way more leaders in the squad. There's new coaches coming in. Everything to play for, new ownership, contracts to play for. It's all on the line now. In yours have come in, it's a clean slate, but you have to perform. If you don't perform, you're kind of out. So I want that. Even though Bruno Fernandes is one of our best players, maybe if not our best player and our captain, I don't want his position to be guaranteed. He has to earn it. And I think anyway, selfishly as a club, as fans, I think we'll see the best of Bruno Fernandes if he actually has somebody like, you know, biting at his heels to start the games. We'll actually see best of him. So I would like to see that going forward. It's probably unlikely, a bit greedy. So maybe only two signings going forward. But let's hope and pray it happens. Let's hope and pray it happens. Anyway, enough waffling. Enough waffling from me. Enough waffling from me about the football. I'm sure some of you guys are bored, absolutely senseless, hearing me talking about my beloved Man United. But I can't lie. The simple things in my life are what brings me joy. And you know what's funny about the simple things in my life that bring me joy? You know what's funny about that? Did anybody else notice how the riots, the UK riots, the race riots, right? The race riots where all these scores of Caucasian people were coming down to all the different parts of the UK to beat up black and brown people because they thought we were taking their jobs and their women. Have you realised something? They've all stopped now the football's back. <laughs> so this game that I love, this beautiful game that I love, it seems as if it's populated by racist. <laughs> Who would have guessed some of the people that were trying to beat people up that like, look like me or that might be Indian, Pakistani or anything else are the same people that support the same club that I do. So it's okay to cheer on some black and brown players on the pitch. But when you go back to your regular life, you want to spare us, you want to crowd us, you want to beat us, you want to chase us down the street. God almighty, what a crazy world we live in. So those guys are basically just bored, right? Those guys are basically bored. They weren't really protesting about, you know, um, they weren't really protesting about trying to bring back England to be a white country and there's too many immigrants and all this sort of stuff. They weren't really worried about that. What they were worried about mostly, no, what they were concerned about was that they were just bored. There was no football. And now the football's back. Suddenly, all these guys are in the pub, having lines, chilling out, beating their wives, kicking their dogs, and they're back to living normal. Who would have guessed it? Who would have guessed it? I know I would. I know I would.